Good evening. We are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody. Um, we are going to start on the presentation of partial and total knee replacements being performed as an outpatient procedure using the revolutionary Navio robotic assist assisted technology hosted by the St. Cloud Surgical Center and presented by Dr. Eric Green from St. Cloud Orthopedics. Thank you all so much for joining us on this event. My name is Sydney Bofferding. I am a marketing consultant. Um, we work with Gaslight Creative. We actually work in conjunction uh, with the staff at the St. Cloud Surgical Center as their marketing team. I will be your moderator for this event. So at this time, this event will be an hour, long, hour and a half long, promptly ending at 7.30. A couple of housekeeping topics that I'd like to discuss before we get started is please make sure that you are muted at all times. This is just um, to ensure that all members of this meeting have a great, uh, are able to hear Dr. Eric Green, are able to see him at all times. So please make sure you keep yourself muted at all times. If you do see myself mute you at, at any point, please know that that's the moderator, just making sure that we stay muted at all times. In addition to that, please have your video camera off so we can just focus on the speaker, um, to make sure that we are muted and so that we continue to be able to focus on Dr. Eric Green. We thank you for your cooperation in that. In the very top right corner on Zoom, you will see the ability to have a group view or a speaker view. And the way I like to see this is there's um, nine boxes in a cluster or there's one larger box. The gallery view is being able to see everybody on the meeting. If you um, don't have that, then you are in speaker view and that is the mode that you want to be. If the speaker view, it's a larger box with two on the top, that's where you want to be so we can focus again on Dr. Green and his presentation. Um, so in, in addition to that, immediately following Dr. Green's presentation, there will be a question and answer portion. So please keep your questions um, and, and hold those for, for the end. You may ask all of your questions in the chat box. So we're actually not going to have anybody go live or, or unmute themselves. We do want you to put those questions in the chat box. If you are unsure of where the chat box is located on Zoom, if you hover over your screen and go down to the very bottom, there is a bar that pulls up and you'll see several different options. One of them in the very middle is a chat option and it's got a bubble for t uh, just like a text bubble, an air bubble as if you would type something into there. As your moderator, I will be watching those and then at the end we will give those to Dr. Eric Green to answer for you. If you have any questions at any time, please also feel free to send me a message and I'm happy to help out with how Zoom works or anything like that. All right, so let's get into welcoming Dr. Eric Green. So again, thank you so much for attending this webinar. We're really looking forward to this. So Dr. Eric Green, introduce him a little bit. He is a board certified orthopedic surgeon, again with the St. Cloud Orthopedics. He is a member of various, various things, but a few of them being the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, the Minnesota Orthopedic Society, Wilderness Medical Society and American College of Sports Medicine. We are so excited to, to hear this presentation. I'm going to let Dr. Green do a better job at introducing himself. So at this time, I'm gonna pass it over to him. Dr. Green, take it away. Thank you, Sydney. Um, and uh, anyway, be, this is usually a presentation that we do uh, on the road and uh, we get to various communities around the state and. So it's a little strange being here in the lunchroom at the surgical center and not having that interaction. But uh, anyway, bear with us and uh, we'll, uh, we'll begin our, our little presentation tonight. So I've got uh, lots of helpers. Uh, Sydney is doing a fantastic job uh, coordinating this uh, all the way from Bozeman, Montana. So I, I appreciate Sydney and her efforts. And, uh, and then I have Lisa Claire here at the surgical center who I couldn't, uh, function without anywhere I go uh, doing all these presentations. So um, so Lisa is uh, getting the, the talk ready to go. And I am buying time. Okay. 
Beautiful. So, uh, so tonight uh, we're going to talk about a, uh, a robotic assist, a robotic system that, that we have available to us to, to help or assist us with, um, with doing partial and full knee replacements. Uh, Navio is the renamed uh, name of the system. It used to be called, called Blue Belt Technologies. And one of the reasons that I started working with the company is that it's a Minnesota based company. Um, so as you head down uh, uh, in Minneapolis towards the airport on 494, right when you uh, cross Highway 55, if you quickly look to the left, you'll see uh, Blue Belt Technologies, uh, which has been uh, bought out by one of the world's largest orthopedic companies, Smith & Nephew, and they've renamed this uh, Navio. So same technology, just a different name. Uh, so I, uh, I'm Eric Green. I'm a, a orthopedic surgeon uh, with St. Cloud Orthopedics, and I've had the, uh, the real privilege of uh, working here at the St. Cloud Surgical Center for 29 years now. Um, uh, I am, uh, by training, a sports doctor, and so primarily my practice has been uh, relegated to uh, the shoulder and the knee. And uh, with that, I, I also do my, I, I, I take care of my patients through the whole spectrum from young sport injuries to, uh, in a way, not so young persons and their, their replacements. And part of all the technologies that I had used, uh, have used and continue to use in sports medicine, it was an easy, easy transition or extrapolation to start then using uh, robotics uh, with, with knee replacements. So I, uh, right place, right time, uh, got to be the first uh, doctor in Minnesota in the Midwest to do a partial knee replacement with a, a robotic system of any kind. Uh, we were also the first, I was the first in Minnesota and the Midwest to do a full knee replacement with robotic assistance. And in fact, we were, uh, I, I was able to be the third one in the United States. So it's a, it's a, a growing field, um, uh, new to orthopedics. And uh, uh, anyway, certainly something that, uh, that we'll see more and more of in the future. Um, so the, again, the system, uh, uh, Navio Robotics, uh, you'll, uh, you'll note, um, let's see if I can get, uh, uh, you'll note in the little diagrams uh, down below on the left, uh, um, the, uh, each of those uh, uh, quadrants or, or pieces show just a little uh, different element of this robotic system. And, and uh, uh, so part of it involves uh, a measuring and doing some planning and and then we use the robotic system to, uh, to help uh, assure the resection of the bone. And then we can go back and check, double check and, and uh, uh, revise as needed. And this, this thing over on the right, you'll see that is the hand piece. And that's, that's the thing that helps me uh, communicate uh, with the robot uh, through you. Uh, and and that's, that's the, the thing that helps us uh, get the surgery done. So um, we advance now. Sorry, a little technical difficulty. Um, let's see, I can just do it manually. Or not. So we're frozen on this picture. Fortunately, it's a good picture. There's a lot to look at, but uh, we're, uh, we're working on uh, trying to get to the next, the next picture. Um, There we go. Uh, so we'll, uh, tonight's uh, talk, we'll, again, this is uh, arthritis of the knee and specifically osteoarthritis. Uh, osteoarthritis is a degenerative process. Basically, just means this is the blessings of birthdays. So it's the, our normal healthy knee that, that breaks down uh, and uh, again, becomes arthritic. It's uh, osteoarthritis is the most common form of arthritis as opposed to the, the inflammatory arthritic conditions. And in fact, in, uh, in some studies, it is felt to uh, affect almost half of us throughout the course of our lifetime to cause some sort of debil debilitation that will require treatment or perhaps even surgery. Um, as you look at, at these little pictures or diagrams, the one on your left shows a healthy knee uh, where the, the cartilages or the menisci are intact and healthy and distributing weight. And most importantly, the, the shiny uh, covering on the end of the bone, the articular cartilage is healthy and smooth and fluid and, and uh, functioning well. Um, there we go. Um, 
the, uh, uh, the picture on the right then shows a diseased or arthritic knee. And, uh, and you'll note that there are some uh, little patchy areas where the, the cartilage has worn down or maybe some wide bands and then these little uh, bone uh, or calcium uh, accumulations. Those are the bone spurs that we can uh, most clearly see on, uh, on x-ray along with the, the narrowing of the joint space, which is sort of like looking at the, the tread on your tires disappearing. Um, arthritis, uh, just like any disease, has a uh, uh, progression uh, from mild to medium to severe. And uh, the image on the left shows a very healthy knee uh, where perhaps a, a young athlete may, uh, may tear a cartilage or knock off a piece of the joint surface. Uh, in the middle, we see a medium stage of arthritis where perhaps there's severe disease, but it only involves one part, leaving the rest of the knee healthy. And a late stage disease, all parts of the knee become involved, the three different compartments and the ligaments and the cartilages, and, and again, sort of all, all different aspects. Uh, so as you look at these x-rays representing that, the, uh, the x-ray on the left is a healthy knee. Uh, you can see the nice joint space and, and really good healthy bone quality and no bone spurs. Uh, that x-ray that you see in the middle, uh, you'll note uh, involves one side of the knee being collapsed. And so as we speak of bone on bone arthritis, I think you can see the, the two bones touching on the right hand side of that, uh, where as opposed to the left hand side of that middle x-ray where you see the nice joint space that's still preserved. So that's the healthier or the good part. Um, the x-ray then way on the right hand side uh, shows advanced arthritis with bone on bone contact of the inside and the outside. And, you see big bone spurs developing, you see the bone starting to shift and you start to see some calcifications and, and loose pieces. Um, so as we start to talk about treatment of, uh, uh, of the arthritis, certainly much of what we'll talk about tonight is, is the surgical side. Um, but as we meet and develop a relationship, we'll talk about uh, first some non-surgical things and uh, things like uh, losing some weight and uh, maybe a couple of pounds or maybe a lot of pounds. And, and we find clearly that, that the, uh, the less one weighs, uh, the less force across the joint and the better, better someone does. Um, we talk about changes in lifestyle or activities and, and actually this is where my patients educate me and they tell me how they uh, get about their activities or changes they make and those are things I can share with my other patients. Um, Anti-inflammatories are, are routine and terribly helpful. So things like Aleve and ibuprofen and and even Tylenol or aspirin or some of the prescription medications. Um, injection treatments are a big part of our practice as we transition from healthy knee to a surgical knee. And those might involve cortisone shots or hyaluronic acid, which is uh, uh, the chemical name for the chicken comb shots or the lubricating shots that you may all be aware of. Uh, we have other injections that we can do that at least in Minnesota are not covered by insurance of, of any type and that would involve uh, spinning, drawing your blood, spinning it down and injecting the growth factors. That's platelet-rich plasma or PRP. Uh, and then and the other uh, would be stem cells. And we could derive that either from a fat source or from the bone marrow. Uh, physical therapy is uh, terribly helpful. We find that uh, active rehabilitation, stretching, flexibility, muscle strengthening and rebalancing, uh, non-impact exercise like riding a bicycle, uh, uh, swimming, uh, pool therapy, very, very helpful. Uh, we have braces, simple or custom that, that can be uh, helpful. Uh, use electrical stim, uh, uh, some magnetic uh, 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 treatments uh, have, have shown some, some uh, treatment, but uh, these again are, are sort of transition things as uh, prior to or leading up to ultimate surgical uh, treatment. So as we start to talk about surgical options, again, as we look at mild, medium, and severe disease, um, over on the left, if uh, it's a young individual with a, a, a focal or a, an isolated lesion, we may talk about putting a scope or a camera in the knee uh, to clean up the tear of the meniscus or to perhaps uh, patch a little hole in the, in the articular cartilage. Uh, in the middle, where we talked about severe arthritis but isolated to one compartment, we may discuss a partial knee replacement, or again, in those later or advanced stages of arthritis, uh, the solution uh, uh, seems to be uh, a full knee replacement. Um, so as we look at each of that, uh, now as we overlie, those are the parts or things that we can put in, a partial knee in the middle, a 
only over on your right hand side. Uh, and again, as, as they're placed into the, the knee, this is an example of uh, what that might look like surgically. So which one is right for you? Uh, partial knee or unicompartmental arthroplasty or a total knee replacement or total knee arthroplasty. It depends on a lot of factors. And uh, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, partial knee replacement is, uh, is probably my favorite operation, at least right now, is, uh, is I, I deal with knee arthritis. Uh, it's, it's an awesome operation. Uh, patients tend to, to like that uh, almost universally. Satisfaction rates are 94, 95, 96%. And you compare that to full knee replacements where, where patient satisfaction rates, again, are excellent, but still more around the 80%. Uh, so 95% of people would say, heck yeah, I'd do it again. And I'd recommend this to my family and my friends. Um, I think the reason this is a, a, a more preferred operation is if you look at that diagram on the right, uh, you'll note that the implant only replaces the diseased part of the joint it preserves the healthy part of the joint, but I think most importantly, right in the center of that diagram, you'll note that those are the main stabilizing ligaments, the cruciate ligaments. I think that's what leads to the, the tremendous patient satisfaction. So it's a smaller operation, smaller incision, less blood loss, quicker recovery, uh, just all things about it, I, I think are a much, much preferable procedure if one is a candidate. Um, now, total knee replacements is a pretty, pretty remarkable operation. In fact, uh, there's uh, one study that, uh, that suggests that maybe this is the most successful operation that we have in all of medicine. Um, five years ago, we looked at about 600,000 uh, knee replacements being done in the United States uh, every year, and that's growing exponentially. Uh, so that uh, three to four years from now, it's thought that that number will be about two and a half million uh, done every year. Uh, again, 90% uh, uh, of people are, are uh, pleased with the outcome. It gets rid of their pain, it gets them back to activity. Uh, and again, they uh, would recommend it to family and friends. Um, back to partial knee replacement. Now, not everybody is a candidate. This is for a specific condition. Uh, and it looks like about 20% of people that have knee arthritis are probably candidates for uh, partial knee replacement of one of the three compartments of the knee. Uh, the inclusion criteria are, uh, again, this has to be isolated arthritis with the, the rest of the knee being healthy, uh, the major ligaments, but particularly the ACL needs to be intact. Uh, our ligaments, uh, other ligaments need to be intact. There have to be uh, minimal deformities or at least uh, fixed deformities. We can deal with some deformity, but it should be passively correctable. Um, and then 250 pounds is, uh, is, is kind of a, a, a rough, uh, rough inclusion or exclusion factor as well. Um, th there was a study done in the New England Journal of Medicine where they looked at 100,000 knee replacements done in the United Kingdom. And they went back and looked at those patients and their x-rays and, and as they studied it, they looked at about, well, 21% of the people that had a full knee replacement probably would have been a candidate for a partial knee replacement. As we then look at other studies, looking at partial knee replacement, uh, uh, again, now this is in the United States, uh, various studies, uh, again, looking at the same group of people, uh, people that have knee surgery, knee replacement surgery, um, various studies would suggest that only 8% or 5% or 3% of people actually have a partial knee replacement, where 20 to 25% of the patients were were uh, candidates. And, and so again, we look at why is that? Uh, much of that is because uh, many surgeons aren't trained in the procedure, uh, but it also is a, it's a, a very challenging procedure. Um, and, and so with some of that challenges, as you look at uh, some of these x-ray examples, and these are knees where the, the parts weren't put in properly. These are not successful operations. I think even from an untrained eye, you can appreciate that there's some issues. and. Uh, and sure enough, if, if the parts, the components aren't placed properly, uh, patients aren't happy with it, these parts don't last long and then have to be redone. So are there things that we can do to make that a more successful and a more pleasing operation? Again, this brings us to the concept of robotic assistance. Um, further, as we look at Foley replacements, it's, it's again, maybe the most predictable operation that we have in all of medicine, um, yet, when you hear that 90% of people would say they would do it again, 
or their pain went away, yet only 80% of people are happy with the operation. You wonder about that 20 to 25%, 18 to 25% of people that are dissatisfied. So there's the element of patient dissatisfaction, but also we look at the parts wearing out. And uh, so every partial or full knee replacement that is placed, I anticipate will wear out and will need to be redone again. But of that, about half of the revisions or redoing this are done within the first two years. That, that's not what our expectations are, either for the patient or the, or the, the surgeons putting these in. And so when, when we look at those failures, looks like about 17% is uh, because of failure of fixation. And that means that either the bone ingrowth or the cement or the glue just didn't take, or perhaps it, it's set up and, and did take, but then someone may fall down the stairs and knock it loose. 21% um, of that is instability. And that means that the, the ligaments weren't balanced properly. And again, that, that patient doesn't feel comfortable or confident and the knee isn't gonna last long. The 12, other 12% 12 then is malalignment. And that just means that those pieces or parts were not put in properly, just like building a structure. If, if things aren't true or aren't uh, aligned well, that, that building or structure isn't going to last and, uh, and neither will a knee replacement placed in a bad alignment. So again, we're back to this uh, robotic solution and can this help us uh, balance ligaments and uh, cover uh, bone and uh, give better fitting? Um, uh, can this give patient, better patient satisfaction in the short term? And then further, can it give us uh, longer lasting components instead of lasting 12 or 15 or 18 or 20 years, might they last even longer by, by putting, be, uh, being put in properly? A couple of years ago then with the advent of robotic uh, procedures, uh, about 15 to 20% of partial knees uh, are, were being uh, placed with some sort of robotic or computerized assistance. And now that this is, is a, a more common and prevalent uh, procedure, those uh, numbers are, are growing. In fact, in Europe right now, it's about 30% of partial knees and full knees are being placed with some kind of robotic assistance. Uh, this has been available to us for partial knee replacements for uh, about seven years now. And uh, for uh, three years now, three and a half years, we've been able to do this with full knee replacements as well. So as uh, uh, for comparison, I, I, you know, these, these techniques that you see on the, on the images are the guides and the alignment jigs and, and that sort of thing that helped us uh, uh, perform uh, these operations 20 years ago and 15 years ago and 10 years ago really really quite successfully and appropriately and and again there's just some of the examples of the jig systems that go in the bone or outside of the bone and and some of the things that we can use to to measure uh, within a millimeter or uh, to change uh, angulation by a degree uh, so we look at uh, success rates with these traditional systems uh, if we uh, can place parts within two to three degrees of a plan or within two millimeters of what our expected bone resection is, uh, that, that's, that's called success. And now with these robotic systems and computerized systems, we look at, uh, at accuracy and precision of one-tenth of a degree or one-tenth of a millimeter. So again, it's about a 20-fold improvement in, in our precision and accuracy. Uh, so as, as we look at these uh, 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 various images uh, that are, are spanning around the screen, we'll look at uh, each of them individually, but uh, th with the, this robotic assisted system, we'll, we'll collect data. Uh, the robotic system will create a three-dimensional uh, diagram. I, I stress the ligaments. We try to balance all of that. I make then some, uh, uh, create a case plan, what I think is, is gonna give us the, the best uh, outcomes. Uh, once we're happy with the plan, then we use the robotic system. On the lower left-hand side, you'll see the burr or the saw that helps us resect bone and really precisely refine that. And then once we put the parts in, as you look down in the lower right-hand corner, we can now stress the ligaments and stress the balance and make sure that we're happy or satisfied with the plan, uh, make changes as needed uh, before we ever uh, finally implant or cement uh, the parts into place.
So again, this is the handpiece, and the three, uh, the four uh, little round discs that you see are, are the way that those are the optics in which we communicate the, the handpiece uh, through the, the visual system into the robot. Uh, similarly, the patient would have an array of, of these optic discs on the thigh bone and on the shin bone. And again, that's the way we communicate the patient through the robot to me in the handpiece uh, so that we can all work together to have that, that sort of a custom surgical solution for each patient. Uh, this is an example then of, of one of the techniques where uh, this is called exposure mode, where as you bring the handpiece into place, uh, you can see that the little burr projects out like a turtle head and, and uh, comes out and resects bone only when it's in a place that we're supposed to remove bone. When we're in a place that bone is not to be removed or maybe where my assistant is standing or where there's a ligament, then that burr quickly retracts uh, uh, back uh, into the cowl and, and continues to move, but, but can't uh, cut or, or remove anything. And usually during our live demonstrations, the first thing I do is I turn the burr on, everybody can see it, and then I put my hand on it. And, and just to show that safety factor that, that the patient and the surgeon and all the assistants cannot, uh, cannot become injured with the, with the device. Uh, one of the big advantages to this system, and this was the first system that uh, did not require uh, CT scans or CAT scans, and, uh, and, and you'll see that, uh, that diagram, uh, this is uh, data or information that's being collected. This is with the older system. We have newer versions of it, but you can see within a matter of seconds, the surfaces are being mapped out and integrated uh, into the, the computer system and a, a three-dimensional uh, model is being uh, generated. So again, this is the optics now are much faster. The collection of data is much faster. And so right now the, the, the planning stage, or at least the CAT scan free uh, planning is, is about four times faster than what you're seeing. Uh, but you see within a matter of seconds, we get an instant CAT scan of the end of the thigh bone uh, and then onto the, the shin bone. Um, so it's precise, it's accurate, it's immediate. It doesn't require a CAT scan that is three months old. Uh, there's some, uh, I guess cost savings to that. CAT scans around about three to four hundred dollars, uh, maybe six or eight hundred dollars. But uh, so so there's that that cost savings, uh, which some insurance companies don't pay for when a CAT scan is used for for surgical planning. Uh, further, there's the uh, benefit of uh, of not having the X-ray exposure. So uh, the amount of radiation that each of us is exposed to on on average everyday existence. One CAT scan is equivalent to about a two-year exposure, daily exposure of radiation. So again, if we could find a way not to have a CAT scan done, I think there's some clear advantages to that. Uh, the analogy that I use and almost in every uh, seminar that we give, uh, a patient outreach thing, there's almost always an automobile person in the crowd. And, and, and so again, I, I use the uh, the comparison is if you're going to spend $400 on a new tire or $1,600 on four new tires for your car, you want them to wear uh, properly. You want to make sure that your car is in alignment and that further that the, the tire is in balance. And if it isn't, it's going to wear up quickly and you'll get some ugly tread wear like you see down that lower left-hand corner. So those are the things that we can achieve with uh, this and uh, other uh, similar robotic systems. Um, so uh, as we start the operation, I, I collect data where I, I find the center of the hip and the ankle and the knee, and we uh, 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 map out the bone surfaces as you see being done right here. The prior image was, was uh, looking at, at stressing the ligaments. So again, it's both a, a, a static and a, and a dynamic evaluation of the, of the knee. Uh, once that three-dimensional model is made, then we can spin that around and make sure that we're happy with the data collection. And, collect more if, uh, if need be. After this is collected, then we can start to do some planning. And, uh, and, uh, and so we interact with the screen. I have a, a computer uh, IT technician with me and I'm doing the planning. My assistant has a, a screen and we can each work uh, jointly or collectively on, on trying to size and fit. Uh, uh, so both fitting and filling the bone, but also uh, uh, balancing ligaments. Um, so we do this both on the thigh bone and the shin bone. We make appropriate uh, adjustments 
Um, and once we're happy with the bone coverage, then we move to this screen where we're doing the ligament balancing. And it's not just with the knee bent 90 degrees and straight, but we can follow this every five to 10 degrees through the, through the full arc of motion and see how will these components track and, and, and will the ligaments be balanced appropriately. Um, after we're happy with the, the planning and we've made some changes, then again, we use uh, various cutting devices to very precisely remove this bone. Um, this is like working on a color-coded topographical map. So purple means four millimeters of bone, uh, blue is two millimeters, green is one millimeter of bone resection. And, and when we get down to white bone, it means that we're to the, to the level of bone resection that we desired. Um, we're also able... The surgical system has a small footprint that seamlessly integrates into OR work. Here, I'll, uh, I'll stop the, uh, the audio of this and... Uh, We've got a little uh, technical difficulty again, but uh, um, so this is a demonstration of, uh, of the Navio surgical system has a small footprint that seamlessly integrates into OR workflow. So that was a friend of mine, Aaron Cook, that put this together for me. He lives out in San Francisco now, but uh, just shows that T card over on the left is the the current robotic system, which is now a about the size, about half the size of your uh, uh, of your paper printer on your computer, and just shows the screen as as we do our planning and and collection data. And then uh, again, this is the handpiece that uh, that the surgeon utilizes. Um, uh, again, once we're ready to remove the bone, that's brought into the the surgical incision, and and uh, and only if the patient and the handpiece and the robot are are all communicating. Are we able to move forward with with the bone resection? So again, this the burr in this case projects out and removes the bone only where it should be. Uh, we're then able to prepare some lug holes or keels or other stabilization elements of the implants. And after doing both the the thigh bone and the shin bone, we can put the little parts in. Um, and these are the trial components with a spacer, and we bring the knee through a cycle of motion. And this is where we have a chance to make some modifications or changes if we wish. And so all of this is done uh, before we're ever committed uh, to the final, uh, final step of the procedure. Um, so again, you saw some x-rays earlier that, that didn't look so pleasing or so good. And here are some examples of knees that we put in with this uh, Navio system. And, and again, you see proper size and fit and, and, and balancing and alignment looks good. And, so both those views in the top, looking at it from the front and then from the side, same, same knees, just looking at them from the side, you get a better idea what, what those parts look like. And these would be the, the sorts of x-rays that we'd look at together when, when you come in for, for your, uh, your follow-up visits in the office. Um, I'm gonna go through this. This is a, a patient from San Francisco that, uh, uh, that had her knee replaced and uh, uh, short answer is she, she loves her knee. So. Uh, so, so we can also, since uh, December of 2016, we've uh, been able to start doing this for full knee replacements. And similar to the, the partial knee that I showed you, instead of just measuring one side of the knee, now we can balance the ligaments you see in uh, blue and green, uh, balancing the ligaments on both sides, the inside and the outside. We map out the entire knee instead of just one half of it. Um, uh, again, uh, this is that mapping uh, process we, we showed a little bit earlier where, where we just put the probe, this uh, guide probe on the top of the surface and just outline the surface and kind of paint the surface. And again, you can see how uh, instantaneously uh, the robotic system is creating a three-dimensional model for us. So this is the bone spurs. This is the areas of erosion. This is the areas of, uh, of healthy uh, joint uh, surface. And and again, helps us uh, helps us determine size and fit and and the thicknesses of bone resection that we uh, ultimately want to look at, so that we can replace that with the metal and the plastic implant. So this is the the mapping or the data collection part. Uh, then again, after we've uh, taken some some ligament balancing, we can start to work on some implant planning. So the robotic system gives us some suggestions on it should be a size seven or a size three, and we can change that uh, up and down and we can move it from side to side and front to back and we can cant and flex and bend and 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 translate and make all of these changes uh, to see 
theoretically, what would this do to our plan? And then if you look at the, those little dots or lines on the bottom of the screen, that's the ligament balance. And we'd like to make sure that that is a flat, uh, a flat um, line, basically, or a flat curve, flatten the curve. Uh, we've heard too much of flattening the curve in this last year, but, but this is a ligament balancing curve. And we'd like to make sure that, that the ligament, every point of range of motion is nicely balanced or has just a little bit of, uh, just a little bit of looseness in it to give that, that a normal natural feeling. Uh, so again, uh, now we can uh, make some changes, moving things up and down to try to, as, as you see, as we make some changes where the left side of the curve lowered and the right side of the curve raised, we can make some changes where the two uh, curves inside and outside start to split. But again, we'd like them to be on top of each other so that the, the knee is balanced equally uh, all around. So again, these are the changes we can make part of that planning process. Uh, and then again, we come to um, uh, the, the different methods of bone resection where either I can put a, uh, a special jig system that you see, uh, I can drill some lug holes and put this um, uh, specific jig that's designed for this robotic system. Uh, we can uh, attach the, the saw or the cutting device or the burr and use that to remove the bone. Um, we can take standard uh, jigging systems and pin or peg them into position. So again, there, there's uh, a versatile uh, number of ways that, that we can use the robotic system to help different surgeons feel comfortable uh, giving the best outcome that, that, that works in their hands. Uh, and again, after we remove the bone, now we have this check device where I, I can put this disc on. And, and if you look on the left-hand side, it will tell me, did we achieve the plan? Uh, you know, if we can uh, get my resected levels within a part of a degree or part of a millimeter or, or preferably exactly spot on, uh, we're going to be happy with that. If not, um, if we strayed from the plan, this gives us the opportunity to modify that and change that. Uh, so again, be before we ever put our parts in, we can be assured that, that we're happy with, with the cut and resection levels. Um, this is, again, just a uh, demonstration. This is the robotic system where you see the, the screen and the robot and the visualization. Uh, and we're just going to move right through this because it is almost a, a duplicate of what you saw previously. So on the, on the screen in front of you then is a knee, uh, a knee replacement that was done with this Navio system. And again, I think you can see how the, the parts, the components, the, the shiny white that you see are the metal parts. And then the kind of dark shadow that you see is, is the plastic. Um, and, and I think it gives you an appreciation of how, how that knee has gone on properly and, uh, um, and, and how uh, this is a, a satisfied patient with a good functioning knee. Uh, so as, as we've gone through this, I know Sydney had instructed you that you, uh, you're welcome to, to uh, uh, ask any questions and, and we'll open that up for some questions. Usually it's, again, a person raises their hand and and we talk about it and the whole group gets to hear it here. You guess you need to type it in and, but I'll, I'll address everyone's questions as they wish. Uh, there are always kind of some routine or standard ones that, that we start out with. And, and again, this may give you a, an opportunity to through the chat feature um, to, uh, to uh, uh, forward any questions that you might have through Sydney and Sydney will uh, then uh, generate the questions and I'll try to come up with an answer. So. Uh, again, am I a good candidate for a partial knee replacement? And, and uh, I think that, again, determines on a lot of factor what your, the disease is, the extent of the disease, your health, uh, uh, again, basically requires that the uh, arthritis is relegated to one, one of the three components, and we can do a partial knee replacement on each of the three parts. Uh, in general, it's about 90 to... 98% of uh, partial knee replacements are done on the inside of your knees. So the area where if you bumped your knees together, uh, somewhere between one and 10% of the partial knee replacements are done on the outside compartment. So if you put your hands on the outside of the knee, it's the outside or the lateral side and less than 1% is done to the kneecap part of the joint. Uh, again, this requires a weight under 250 uh, that you don't have inflammatory arthritis. Um, and you know, I, I think for the most part, you'll want to have made sure that you're, um, you failed uh, or at least trialed some non-operative surgical things before proceeding uh, with the surgery. 
Uh, similarly, are you a good candidate for a full knee replacement? And, and so if for whatever reason you have advanced arthritis and it's bone on bone arthritis, uh, those are people that tend to have the best outcomes uh, that you have, uh, again, exhausted simple, easier, uh, uh, cost-effective treatments if they aren't working any longer. Um, and again, if you have severe arthritis, uh, you have the contractures or the, the stiffness and limitations, uh, a full knee replacement may, may be an excellent, uh, an excellent solution for you. Um, another question I get asked is how long will the implants last? Uh, so if you read every research study ever done in the world, doesn't matter what part or how you put it in, these are even knees that were placed 20, 30 years ago, 15 years out from the initial surgery, 90% of knees are still in place and still functioning. So again, we, we hope that these parts last 15, 18, 20 years. Uh, further, by putting them in with robotic system uh, or robotic assistance, if they're placed more properly or appropriately, uh, can we then get even uh, longer lasting uh, longevity? And that's, I, I guess that's the gift that we'll give uh, to the next generation, to our kids and our grandkids. And specifically, what are the benefits of the system? Uh, again, there's so many of them. It's, uh, it doesn't require a CAT scan. It can be done for partial or full replacements. Uh, the new version can also be used for hip replacements. Uh, it, uh, again, I think gives each of us a custom, uh, a custom solution for each of our arthritic conditions. Uh, and then again, it's the precision and the accuracy of the robotic system that I, I, I I think it's just another uh, glaring uh, feature of this. And then furthermore, it's, it's a Minnesota-based company, and, and at least for me, that, that, that spoke a lot. Um, so uh, right now, we'll uh, open this up to some questions, and looks like Sydney is coming back in to take over. Um, All right. So again, thank you for uh, uh, bearing with some of these uh, uh, anyway, some of the learning things on this uh, new format of Zoom. A lot of you are probably sick of Zoom meetings, but uh, um, I'd sure rather be out there in the public and saying hi and meeting people and having some snacks afterwards. But anyway, this is the best we have. So thank you, Sydney, and thank you, Lisa, for helping me put this together. And thank you, all of you, for, for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Green. Great information. We do have a couple questions here, so I'll start going through them. I'll start right at the top. Uh, so, so we did have somebody ask, um, why do so many people have to wait so long before anybody will fix their knee? It seems like one could heal better if it didn't have as much damage. It sounds like maybe she's been suffering for a little bit of time. Yeah. A few years. So a uh, great question. And, uh, and I, I, I think no one wants to see patients suffer. You know, I think that's the reality of it. Um, um but I think it's also, some people have horrible arthritis and have, very few symptoms. Most people are going to respond to simple things like cortisone shots or anti-inflammatory, the things that we all mentioned. And I, I think it's also a worthwhile exercise to try some of those things. And I think if, if you try them and they work, you can continue to do them. Uh, I think there's so, such low risk options. Uh, but I think it's once you've tried them and, and they either don't work any longer or they never did work, it becomes an easier discussion to say, well, Let's do a big operation. And, you know, I think, frankly, everything has a risk with it, whether it's a medication or a surgical treatment. And, and I think it's easier to tolerate or accept that risk if we said, well, we have exhausted simple, easy things. Um, we also find that as, as we look at x-ray evaluation, some patients will come and see me and say, gosh, I, I want my knee replaced right now. And, and we look, and, and they may have only worn maybe 30% of the joint surface. And so when we look at the people that still have a lot of joint space remaining versus people that are 100% worn out and they're touching bone on bone, the people that are touching bone on bone are much happier and have better outcomes. So the part of it is, is, is we want to try to, you know, walk through that together. Um, but, but you are right. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps we wait too long for some people. But I'll also tell you, those are uh, the most grateful patients. Is uh, my favorite thing to hear about patients or from a patient is, uh, you know, why why did we wait so long? And that's so. Thanks, Dr. Green. So the next question is, what is the benefit of having this procedure done out as an outpatient? Yeah, yeah. So uh, so uh, just like um, 
uh, robotic assistant assistance is a, is a new uh, a new variation of this theme. Uh, so is uh, outpatient surgery. Um, and so when we started doing outpatient uh, replacements, it was uh, uh, primarily just with partial knee replacements. And the good news is no matter what age, uh, no matter what insurance, is we were able to do partial knee replacements on an outpatient basis. And I think part of the experience that we gained from that, the comfort level and showing that uh, um, you know, it, it is successful, it is safe, the complication rate is very small and limited. We now have been able to extend that to full knee replacement safely. Again, bigger operation, uh, more risk, that sort of thing. But, but the sort of the lessons we've learned along the way are is this is very safe. And uh, uh, anyway, it, it, it works remarkably well. Part of our, our limitation on, um, on full knee replacements in an ambulatory surgical center or outpatient um, was uh, uh, kind of dictated by insurance. So with private insurance and people under 65, we could do outpatient procedure for anyone who's healthy and wish to do it. Uh, it was just after the first of this past year that the, it was about a three year process, but the federal government then kind of looked at our experience with some younger folks and said, well, heck yeah, this works well and, and can also be done very safely and appropriately for people that are 65 and older. So, uh, so again, now we've started to look at those patients. We have looked and back on our successes and our failures. And when you see the anesthesia doctor, they give you a rating, a classification. And for appropriate healthy individuals, it appears that 70 to 80% of people over 65 can safely be done outpatient, either at a hospital or at a surgical center. Great. How about the risk of infection? Yeah, risk of infection. So, uh, uh, great question, um, and that that's that's you know probably one of my one of my biggest concerns with with uh, knee replacements because if you're that unfortunate person to get an infection, it's a it's a disaster. Um, we usually look at people being on antibiotics for six to twelve weeks, and uh, you know having to have their knee parts removed, and after three months of no knee parts in, uh, having parts put back in you know, with antibiotic cement and other precautions. But instead of infection risks or rates being around 1% or 2%, after you've had an infection, now moving forward, your infection risk is about 30%. So overall, we look at uh, kind of across the country, across the world, and infection risk uh, being about 1% to 2%. Again, depends on age and other disease things like circulation and, and diabetes. Uh, interesting thing is when we look at doing the exact same operation, when we look at knee replacements, partial or full, being done at a hospital, any hospital, anywhere in the United States, the infection risk is about 2%. And when you look at having that done at the surgical center, it's about one half of a percent. So again, I, I think uh, really good reasons to do it at the surgical center if, if, if you can, if you're, if you're a candidate. So this particular in individual, it sounds like they were scheduled for a full knee replacement in February, but it has had to postpone um, or had it postponed. And just curious when they can expect to have it rescheduled, if they can get sure. in contact with somebody. Yeah, yeah. So the uh, anyway, 2020 has been just uh, an atrocious year. It's uh, uh, my daughter just got married two weeks ago. And, you know, just to watch their planning process and guests coming or can't coming and and, and so that's affected all of us, and, but especially medicine. Uh, so in the state of Minnesota, uh, Governor Walz, um, I believe, uh, uh, put a, a halt uh, to elective surgical procedures. I think it was March 23rd. Um, so we were able to get some people in before that. Um, after we were able to open up and uh, do elective surgical procedures again, it took us about five weeks here at the surgical center. Uh, to get caught up and uh, catch up on that backlog. So uh, we're, we're open for surgery, uh, uh, hospitals, different. So every, every institution, it's up to them to decide what makes the most sense and what's safest. Um, so I, I know our St. Cloud Hospital has been a little slower to open up for surgical procedures, uh, but for the surgical center, we have been caught up and are actively scheduling on a normal basis uh, moving forward. Now, 
not to say that you couldn't schedule your surgery for October and Governor Walls may put a, may shut it all down again. That's, that's the great unknown about this whole COVID thing and, and what will happen with second phases or third phases. So lots, lots of uncertainty. Absolutely. So you may have covered this, but I'm just going to reiterate it just in case. Um, so as far as insurance coverage, is there any difference between the robotic versus a traditional knee replacement? Yeah, yeah, great question. So, uh, so first of all, um, so the simple answer is there's no difference. There's no difference. It's just a matter of uh, will your insurance company allow you to have a full knee replacement? Will your insur insurance company allow you to have a partial knee replacement? That's all it comes down to. Um, basically, for me, this robotic system is just, it's my fancy tape measure and it's my fancy saw, that's all. It, it just, it's the precision device that I use. Uh, Carpenter may like to use Milwaukee tools or DeWalt tools. Uh, you know, they have the choice of what they like. And so for me and for us, this is simply the tools that I use for measurement and for cutting. Um, and so with that, there is no additional charge or expense to the patient. There's no additional charge or expense to the insurance company. And didn't matter if we did add the charge, the insurance companies are not paying anything extra or different currently. I, I think as we start to collect the data and look at this, I think as we show uh, better outcomes and uh, uh, more accurate placement, and then we start to follow that along on how long the parts last, I think in the future, insurance companies will be paying to have it done. They'll pay extra to have it done this way because they know they're gonna save money in the long term by not having to have it done or redone as quickly or as often. Okay. Understandable. As far as partial knee replacements, do you feel like it's necessary in time to do a full knee replacement due to wear and tear on opposite sides? Yes. Um, yeah, so that, that's the million dollar question. Um, so uh, whether I do a partial replacement or whether I do a full knee replacement, I am expecting to have to redo it again. Uh, you know, you buy a nice pair of shoes, you buy tires for your car, you buy a refrigerator, you know that all of those things are gonna wear out and you need to replace it at some point. Uh, so I plan as I go into this that yes, the parts are going to wear out and they will need to be redone. And whether that's a partial knee, whether it's a full knee, that will need to be redone at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. Part of planning for the future is it is, is much simpler, uh, much easier, much less destructive or invasive to the patient to have a partial knee removed and put in a full knee than it is to take out a full knee and to put even a bigger full knee. Um, so, so yes, I, I, so I've had some patients that say, well, I never want to have this redone again. And, and I'd say, yeah, wouldn't that be nice? But that's also planning on you hope that you're going to die before your knee wears out. And I, I hope you live a long time and you get to use it and you wear it out and, and we'll have that chance to, to redo and, and revise it again in the future. Um, and so in a perfect world, arthritis, so if we do a partial knee replacement, the arthritis in the other parts of the knee would get bad or severe on exactly the same day that the parts I put on one side wears out. You know, one is usually gonna win the race, but hopefully they happen at about the same time frame. And again, hope, hopefully they have happen 12, 15, 18, 20, 22, 29 years down the road. Beautiful. What type of testing is required prior to surgery to help determine partial versus total? Yeah, uh, so, so typically on our first, uh, uh, first meeting, you know, we'll take a history, we'll talk, we'll converse, uh, uh, talk about where is your pain? You know, what, how is this limiting you? Uh, uh, because sometimes the findings I see on the x-ray or the findings I feel with my hands are going to be different than what you're coming to complain about. Um, if I see really bad arthritis on the inside of your knee, but you're talking about pain on the outside of the knee, I want to make sure that our, our solution addresses all of your complaints. So, so we take a history, we talk about things. Uh, I do a physical exam, that's probably where I get most of my information is with my hands and the testing. Uh, and then we want to make sure that we have current x-rays. Uh, ideally, I'd like them to be within three months. Uh, 
you know, certainly if they're a year old, those aren't accurate. Uh, but um, uh, so we need current views. There are also sometimes some specialized views that I that I, I need or that they need to be weight bearing views. All right. I need to have the knee a little bit bent. So I take your muscles uh, away from kind of splinting or supporting you. And so anyway, there, there's just usually some specialized x-rays and that's, that's it. And usually based on that, talking about uh, treatment options, what have you done? What are, what's available to us? And then what makes sense? And, and so again, it's, it's uh, these criteria based on x-ray and examination and interview where or then we kind of tease that out. Is it a partial knee? Is it a full knee? Okay. But it, it doesn't require, typically it doesn't require CAT scans or MRI scans or, you know, any of those uh, sort of more, uh, I guess, fancy imaging studies or expensive imaging studies. Sometimes it does because we need that information to make a plan. Almost always it's based on examination and x-ray. Awesome. Well, that concludes our questions at this time. I don't know if you had any follow-up stuff, Dr. Green. Otherwise, I have a couple things. All right, beautiful. I, uh, um, yeah, I have some knee models if people kind of want an idea. You saw the, the little diagrams or whatnot, and this is just a, uh, an image of, uh, oh, wrong way, there we go, of <laughs> what a partial knee looks like. And, and again, it's it just on this side of the knee as opposed to the, uh, the full knee replacement. This time, this time it's a very specialized metal. It's called oxinium, and uh, again, it's it's a metal that seems to have great uh, uh, duration or, or uh, wear characteristics. The plastic, the white stuff, is pretty much the same, whether it's a full knee or a partial knee. Uh, but anyway, those are, are just a couple of any of the models that I usually have available that people can come up and touch and feel, and we pass it around, and almost invariably somebody breaks it, and the parts fall on the ground. So anyway, I've spared, spared someone that embarrassment. So. <laughs> okay. uh, one of the questions was, is the kneecap removed? Yeah, yeah, that's such a great question. Um, so for uh, partial knee replacements, the majority that I do on the inside and the outside of the knee, you keep your own kneecap. It's because it's, it's not diseased, and it's functioning well. Um, so for unless the partial knee replacement is because of arthritis of the kneecap, then yes, your kneecap gets replaced. Almost, almost universally, partial knees, kneecap doesn't get replaced. So now we come to full knee replacements. And historically in the United States, we have always replaced the kneecap. Doesn't matter whether there's disease or not, the operation including replacing the kneecap. Now, the current trend in the United States for some surgeons just really in the last year, year and a half or two years is that we're not replacing the kneecap. Um, in the United Kingdom, they haven't replaced kneecaps in 30 years and their patient satisfaction and functional outcomes, clinical outcomes are exactly the same as ours are. Um, so the advantage to not replacing the kneecap, so first of all, if you've had your kneecap replaced, you shouldn't ever kneel on it again. That, that's the downside to it. Um, so if you've had your kneecap replaced, I ask that you not kneel on your knee. Uh, by not replacing the kneecap, you are allowed to kneel on the knee, and then I don't have as much fear of you cracking or breaking uh, or dissociating the parts. Um, so you are allowed to kneel. Some patients don't feel like it. They just say, well, it's just a little too tender, it's a little too sensitive, but that becomes a patient choice. Right now in my practice for full knee replacements, about 90% of people were able to keep their kneecap, 90, maybe even 95%. So, um, so at least, again, my experience, my practice is I try not to replace the kneecap if, if it looks like the patient has a healthy one. Uh, now that's, again, not true across the United States or even in the state, um, but that, I, that, I think that is the future direction of, of knee replacements. Um, and then is there, um, does anybody have any allergic reaction to the metal parts? Yeah, gosh, that's another good question. So, um, so true metal allergies are really, really rare. Um, super, super rare. Uh, some patients have true metal allergies and usually those patients know it. You know, they can't wear a wristwatch because their skin turns green or orange or whatever. They get a bad rash. Uh, someone puts an earring in and, uh, and they'll say, you know, their skin breaks out. So it's usually it's the nickel in, in the, in the uh, 
stainless steel alloy. Uh, 916L is, is what cobalt chrome or stainless steel is that, that tells a metallurgist how much of this and that and the other thing it is. But it seems to be the nickel uh, in that alloy that, that people react to. Uh, so most people are aware of it uh, based on jewelry and whatnot. Furthermore, when I showed you this uh, fancy black stuff, this oxinium, uh, this is uh, the only metal available to us or the metal alloy available to us um, that people with true metal allergies can have. So the oxinium is the solution to that. And, and, and so as you anyway look on the uh, table of elements, uh, this is a metal that's weighed down by, uh, by, uh, by titanium. So it's a, it's a, it's a really uh, um, biologically uh, just, it's a, a remarkable metal that matches our bodies really, really well. Uh, the physical, the chemical, the physical, the physics property matches our body. And then by doing that kind of black coating, the sort of a ceramicized surface, uh, it, it just, it, it's tolerated so well by the body. Great. So allergies happen super, super rare. So the next question is, is I have some problems with my knee, a lot of pain when sitting or laying. Um, I have some pain while walking, but while running uphill or flat running, I have no knee pain. Mm. I can't run downhill with too much pain. Does this make any idea with this since the replacement would force me to stop running? Does this, does this help? Does this make sense to this question? Yeah. So, uh, so I would say that that's not the most common or typical presentation that I see, but, but again, every, every patient's different. And that's the whole point of let's, let's talk, let's, let's hear what, what is your problem? What provokes it? Where is your pain? Um, so that first kind of helps me get an idea, you know, where the problem is or the extent of problems. Um, uh, so yeah, that's, that's a little bit challenging. Um, you know, most people with impact activities like standing for long periods of time, uh, prolonged walking or the impact of sports and running would say it's anyway I can't do them it, those those are things that that drive me crazy that that cause my pain uh, so I some of the first things I'm I think I'm hearing is that this is going to be more arthritis involving the kneecap so when I hear someone have pain going downstairs or downhills that's a kneecap problem you know, it's the most common thing we see people for in the knee clinic um, but it could be an arthritic kneecap issue. And with that, maybe this person would be a candidate for a partial knee replacement of their kneecap. Again, it's rare, but it sounds like that this could be the case from what little bits I'm hearing. But that, that's something we would tease out with the x-ray and the exam and, and whatnot. Right. So, and it's my understanding that tomorrow after this presentation, all of these individuals will receive a consultation form. Um, and they can fill this out to receive some more information. Um, and then it will be sent to the St. Cloud Surgical Center and then somebody will be following up. So those type of questions, it sounds like they'd be able to answer or at least schedule. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think in the information that you were kind of screening through there, yeah. there's a, my contact info. If people want to reach out to me and we can sit and talk, there's no commitment. You don't have to have surgery because we sit down and talk. Uh, but yes, there will be a, a follow-up and uh, and you're welcome to send us a note. Uh, Lisa has been great at coordinating uh, those individuals from either in-person seminars or this and and then my my uh, my secretary Tracy she runs my life so be really nice to her when you guys talk to her. But anyway she'll uh, she'll work with you to get an appointment and or, or answer any other questions you might have. That sounds great. Certainly other opportunities to chat more about does this make sense and what are what else can we do? Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Green, and thank you so much to those who have attended. Thank you for be, just being willing to share your knowledge and for those who did ask questions, we so appreciate that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, which will have the information for tomorrow's consultation form as well as contact form. Uh, and have a great night. <laughs> awesome, great. Thank you, Sydney, and thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lisa, sitting here next to me. She makes things, my life so much better. So thank you all. Thank you. Have a great night. Good night.